something that I'm turning recording on. And with that, let me welcome everybody to the January meeting of the Electric Railroaders Association. I'm still uh, letting people in. If you're wondering why I'm a little distracted, we certainly want to get as many people uh, watching the show. And what I'm going to do is turn the waiting room off so everyone can come in. Uh, just a few formalities. The next uh, Zoom meeting will be on February 17th, 7.30. The program will be given by Eric. I think Eric and Mary Azustowitz and uh, Mary, the family ancestry goes back to Ukraine. They're going to be doing a program on the Ukraine since we're approaching the one year anniversary uh, of the hostilities, uh, the hostilities over there. Um, Registration has opened for the 2023 convention in Portland and Seattle. We're returning to uh, Portland first time since Jack uh, hosted the trip in 2010. Seattle may be our first time since 1992, so it's been a long time uh, coming. If you think you're interested, I would book the hotel right away. We're keeping the room blocks tight. Uh, you can always uh, cancel two days before. If you're traveling by yourself and uh, you're looking for a roommate, just email me. You still should book a room and then we'll see if we can uh, match you. No guarantee. You're best to find your own roommate. But just go to erausa.org. You will see all the information and you can also uh, also book uh book the trip online uh now with that i'm just going to go through a few formalities about tonight's program the program is going to be given by jack man i'm going to introduce him momentarily uh the program is will be recorded and it will appear on era tv which is managed by our webmaster and first vice president sandy campbell um if you have questions, uh, I don't want people shouting them out. What we always ask people to do is put your questions in the chat for everyone. One or two things will happen. It's possible other people in the group will answer the question, or if not, I will gather similar questions. And at an appropriate time where Jack has a break, his presentation, I will ask him the question. At the end of the program, you will have time to, um, we will allow everyone to turn their video and unmute and um, ask and talk to Jack directly. With that, let me introduce Jack. He's our longtime conventions and trip chairman. He actually started uh, the trip program, both domestic and international, ran it for many years. He's a former editor of Headlights. Um, he has returned to foreign travel during 2022 after the pandemic, and his program is devoted to his two journeys to Europe this past year, one to France, the other to Belgium. Um, France has been a real pioneer post-1985. They have increased by more than two dozen installations and now approaching 30, and Jack has tried to catch up with with many of them. He has visited eight properties directly, uh, and he's going to tell you more about that. Additionally, the Musée de Transport Urbain uh, Bruxellois went all out to celebrate its 40th anniversary and took over two lines of the Brussels tramway system last May. Jack was there riding and photographing the array of streetcars, many over 100 years old in the PCC era in Antwerp, drawing to a close. He took a close look at those cars on the street, and that city's tram museum. So uh, with that, once again, if you have questions, put them in the chat. And uh, with that, Jack, uh, you are a co-host. Why don't you take it away? Everyone, your attention to Jack. And Jack, share your screen and go forward. Good evening, everybody. I will try to share the screen right now. We'll it's always traumatic for me to do that. <laughs> Let's see if that works. Mm 
right now i'm not all right i i just did one more thing try it again i i thought making you a coast would do it but I'm, i did the other thing try it again jack it should be okay now okay here we go show all windows Ta -da. Here we go. Okay, and yep, we see the Eiffel Tower. I just need to make it full well, screen. We'll set. There you go. Okay, we're good. Well, this is a very good representation of France, and um, I made a number of notes for this presentation, and I'm going to try to read them as best I can. I scheduled a trip to France in early September this past year. Two new tram lines and major extension to one more had occurred in Paris since my last visit in 2018. Also, Cannes had thrown out its rubber tired guided tramway and replaced it with a light rail system. Two new lines had been added to the tramway in Nice, a second tram train tram train line had been opened in Nantes and small streetcar operations had begun in two other cities, not to mention new rolling stock in many places as well. A lot to do in 12 days, and I fortunately persuaded Rich Aaron of Chicago to accompany me. We spent our first three days in Paris and Karl Heinz Robert from the Ruhr in Germany joined us there. Paris is the capital and largest city of France with a population of 2.2 million. It is the center of the smallest of France's official 18 regions, the Ile de France, which itself has a population of 12.2 million, all with one public transit fare system. NJ Transit, take note. Ile de France Mobilities has many different operators of transit services including the SNCF, which is the National Railway System, the RATP, the local Paris Metro and bus system, and some 90 private bus carriers. The fare system contains the usual range of single multi-ride weekly, monthly, and even annual tickets and passes. Its MetroCard and Omni equivalent is the contact-free Navigo Liberté. A short distance ride in Paris on a bus or the metro is $1.50, half for seniors and so on, with a daily fare cap of $7.50 for regular riders. At the time of the trip, the dollar and the euro were at par. So now 5 to 10% added should be added to the prices I'm going to quote to be accurate. We bought weeklies mine in addition to my existing photo card from a previous trip, which run from Monday to Sunday for $22.50. And that's why we arrived on Monday, albeit separately. A daily pass outside the Navigo fare system ranges from $7.50 to $17.80, depending upon the zone selected. The airport is in zone five, the most expensive. So using Navigo was quite a bargain despite having to provide a photo. Paris is a rail transit fans paradise with 14 metro lines and 12 tram lines with another soon to open. The T11 and T13 were originally termed tram train lines along with the T4, but are now called express tram lines. They are nothing like the Karlsruhe model where riders boarding at suburban commuter stations are carried without transferring through the city center on the tram, which I believe is the real meaning of tram train. The T11 and T13 lie on a mainly freight circumferential route way outside of central Paris and connect with other lines to take passengers into the city. I followed the weather forecast for France for a week prior to the trip and was disappointed that except for the period I'd be in the south of the country, the prediction was for rain, rain, and more rain. 
Thus, I was pleasantly surprised when the sky was mostly blue upon the landing of my United Boeing 777 at Charles de Gaulle Airport early in the morning. Checking the forecast for the day, it was still to be rain, so I decided to take advantage of the sun that was now rising while I could, and instead of heading straight for our hotel, would try to ride and photograph the T4 as one end of the light rail line starts at a stop on the RER line that runs from the airport to downtown. So these next slides represent me running around with my luggage. The T4 is operated by the SNCF, the National Railroad System, and its first five miles were opened in 2006 after the conversion of a lightly used branch line from electric railway to tramway. It was called a tram train line, probably because the cars are dual voltage, 25 kV AC and 750 volts DC. The conversion included changing from left hand running to right hand and reducing its catenary voltage to 750 through the suburban area in which it runs. Cl crossing gates were removed in favor of traffic lights in built up areas but the infrastructure still looks like a railway. Later in 2020, a branch was built with tracks being placed mostly in center reservation on suburban streets. This portion surely looks like a streetcar operation. Let's take a ride. My luggage and I changed from RER line B that runs from Charles de Gaulle to Gare du Nord to the T4 at aulnay sur bois the line's original northern end. But, but this time the rolling stock was one of the new 100% low floor Alstom Citadis Duales cars obtained for the extension onto the new branch. The SNCF platforms and tracks are to the right in this photo. We'll continue our survey after jumping to the other end of the line, Bondi, where LRVs connect to RER line E which runs over lines emanating from Paris S station. A check the stock the pictured reason. here represents the original 15 70% low floor Siemens Avanto cars from 2006, which interestingly are very similar to their S70 and S700 cars that operate here in the US, but these are dual voltage. Jack, this is a very technical question. You may or may not be able to answer the question from Gregory Katz is, do these trains have main switches with pneumatic arc blowout? I haven't the faintest idea. All right, there's some engineers also here. Feel free to uh, converse with Gregory. All right, thank you, Jack, go ahead. The map shows the original five mile long line from 2006 at its top and the four mile extension from 2020 at the bottom. Service from Bondi to the two terminals operates every 10 minutes on each branch, providing a five minute headway on the joint portion. Both types of equipment are shown at Bondi in this photo with the SNCF platforms and right of way on the left. It should be mentioned that the revenue part of the T4 is operated entirely at low voltage with the 25 kV AC used only for the rolling stock to reach the shops, which are located along the SNCF line to Paris S. Another view at Bondi of the two different types of cars that run on the line. Les Coquetières with a Siemens train. By the way, I never took French in school and my pronunciation is probably going to be way off. Plans are to replace them with more Duales units in the near future. Also at Les Coquières, the Siemens trains are usually operated on the Aulnay service, but I've been told that they have been seen running to Hôpital de Montfermet on occasion as well. Note the ballasted right of way representing the characteristics of the original railroad line. Republique Max Dormoy is the first stop.
after the junction at Gargan. Here, the right of way is grassed, New Orleans style, which is actually quite common, and I say even predominant on most lot, light rail lines in France. Notre Dame de Anne stop. The line is full of 90 degree turns, making it a bit slow. There was only enough room for a single track from Arboretum, the next to the last stop, to the end of the line at Hôpital de Montfermet. But double track at the terminal. I then proceeded to our hotel, but it still arrived before my two other companions. We, when they did come, we had an early supper and I spent per, slept perfectly after being up continuously for about 40 hours. And as a result, I had defeated jet lag. Now on to the T-13. Upon rising on the following morning, we noted that the weather prediction was the same for rain but you'll see it wasn't like that when we got to the outlying suburb of Saint-Germain and Lai by Metro line M3 and RER line A. To put the location of the T13 express tram line in perspective, it lies some 13 miles from the center of Paris or 10 miles from the tr tram line T13, now T3A and T3B, I should say, uh, 10 miles from tram line T3, now the T3A and T3B, which runs along the periphery of the original cities. This is a dual voltage Alstom Citavis Dualis at the Saint Germain and Lay terminal of the T13 Express, adjacent to the station of RER line A, which terminates underground at this point. These cars are virtually the same as the ones you just saw on the T4. The, T, the LRV lays over here on single track, which leads directly onto a double track right of way where the line operates right-handed to the Camp de Loge stop alongside a road named Avenue du President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. One station beyond Camp de Loge, about a mile outside Saint-Germain, at Lucier Pierre, the line changes over from right hand running to left hand and from 750 volts DC to 25,000 volts AC. Here's the station that I'm talking about. I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, I hope so. The rest of the route follows the SNCF Grand Centure line, mostly southward to a Sancerre terminal, slightly west of. Versailles. The T-13, which opened on July 6, 2022, is 12 miles long in total and runs over trackage that last saw passenger service in 1939. It passes an additional SNCF radial commuter line and then intersects two more at a southern terminal. And one of these lines is used by LRVs to reach the lines, car house, and shop. From the station platforms at the Zia Perer, one can observe the changeover between right and left-handed running. A Saint-Germain bound LRV is shown. And of course, that's the rear. The line turning to the left of the saint Cyr bound car is the continuation of the Grand Centure, and we'll eventually see a branch of this express tram service extended to Poissy and then to Archereville. The T13 is operated by TransKio T13, a public-private partnership, PPP, that includes the SNCF and Keolis. LRVs run every 10 minutes in peak hours and every 20 in non-rush periods. Here is a view from the Marais Mali stop showing the old SNCF station and its high level platforms. Again, these high level platforms were taken out of service in 1939. Further down the line at Bali, 
and here at Allais Royale. Between Allais Royale and Porte de Saint-Cyr, the next to the last stop is where this picture was taken. And finally, the Saint-Cyr terminal. While riding, we did not observe much going on and only a few autos were in the park and ride lot. Not much patronage either. The area needs to build up. Now back to Saint-Nom-la-Bretache, where we transferred to the suburban line L to Saint-Lazar station back in Paris. Some 22 of these open gangway MU trains were built in 2017 when we rode the when we rode the train, it actually rained for a while on our 45 minute journey back to civilization. So the forecast was right. After a quick lunch snack, we rode automated Metro line M14 to two for two stops to Port de Clichy, one stop in from the outer terminal of the recent 2018 three mile eight station extension of the T3B from Port de la Chapelle to Port de Asnières. This was another part of my to-do list. The sky had turned blue by then and it remained that way for the rest of the afternoon. Here's a map showing the T3A and T3B. We stopped off for photos at a couple of stops. The combined route went into service in 2006 and now employs 72 Citadis 402 units, the latest built last year over its now 17 mile long route with service running about every six minutes. This is the line closest to the center of Paris and the center of course is right here where and the Seine River runs right through it. It uses mostly center reservation in the boulevards that replace the old Petit Centure wall circling the city. All of the other tram lines are outside this perimeter, also, although some get to the perimeter. We finished our T3B rides at Rosa Park Station, where the line starts running parallel to RER line E and the throat to Gardelis. We split up at that point as Rich and Carl Heinz wanted to cover the T4, while I decided to ride the TFS2 cars on the T1 for probably the last time, as the 70% low floor 1992 built units are now 30 years old and soon will be replaced by modern 100% low floor cars. So we rode an outbound RER E line train, but I got off at Noisy Le Sec before they did at Bondi, and I transferred to the T1 at its Eastern terminal. Here is a view of a TFS two car at Bobigny Pablo Picasso, once the outer Eastern terminal of the continually extended line. The first of Paris's current 12 tram lines was opened in 1992 and is now 11 miles long with 37 stops. This very busy route runs every seven minutes and intersects a host of Metro and RER lines, plus other trams and suburban train routes as well. The 35 short single articulated cars are usually very crowded. There are 37 Citadis X05 replacements are scheduled to arrive in 2024 and we will leave that as they will, as they will contain five sections. I stopped off also at the Hôpital Avicenne stop and finally left the line at the busy Saint-Denis station where it connects with RER line D. Its current temporary location is on the other side of the station, creating a longer walk for passengers connecting to RER B trains to the center of Paris until a new relocated stop is constructed with platforms sufficiently long to serve the future five section cars. Line T8 crosses the T1 at 90 degree 
at a 90 degree angle near the old stop and I walked over for a few photos. The T8 is five and a quarter miles long <clears throat> and has two branches. It was opened in 2014 and is equipped with 20 Alstom Citadis 302 cars. Both branches of the T8 reached the T11 express line, which I didn't visit on this trip, but I want to show for completeness. So I've added a peek at the routes I didn't ride on this trip. <clears throat> like the T13 express on the west side of the Grand Centure, the T11 uses part of the northern portion and is also operated by a PPP company using the Navigo fare system. The seven mile long line was opened in 2017 and has 15 Citadas Duelis cars sport red trim, trim instead of the, bl the blue on the T13 and the T4. You can see the freight line to the right in this view near the Villa Tenuez Universite station. LRVs run on the seven to 12 minute frequency on separate tracks because of the large amount of freight activity on this line. The weather forecast for our next day again was the same. And as it happened, we had clouds, sun and rain. The T9 was the last route on my list and we rode the M2, M6 and M7 Metro lines to reach its normal Northern terminal at Port de Choisy. We had to be careful to get on the right M7 trains, as this metro line has two southern branches. The T9 is six and a half miles long and opened in April 2021. And it employs a fleet of 22 Alstom Citadis 405 cars on its almost perfectly straight route southward on center reservation. This LRT line replaced the heaviest bus route in Paris and cars operate every four to six minutes. This photo shows an LRV turning from its layover point of, along the circumferential boulevard, Boulevard Messina in this case. Interestingly, interestingly and consistently, it does not have a track connection with tram route T3A. Each of Paris's LRT lines operate independently of all the others with their own car house and no track connections, except for the T3A and T3B combination. The line's most notable landmark is the sculpture at Musée MACVAL stop. The MAC stands for Musée Art Contemporain Val de Marne. The line does jog for a block here near the four Perry stop. It then continues south again, running parallel to a railway line. The car has just left the Christophe Colombo station near the T9 southern end and its shop. With lots of time left in the day, we rode Metro Line M7 two ba stops back from Place de Choisy to Maison Blanche, reverse direction, and rode a train on its other branch to Village Jouef. Louis Aragon terminal of tram route T7. By then it had clouded up again. The T7 is seven miles long and was opened in 2013. It uses 19 Alstom Citadis 302 cars and runs every seven to 10 minutes. I had ridden this line in 2018, but I'm always game for another cut of it. We first rode out, rode out to its outer terminal at Port de la Son, which is right after the airport Orly stop, one of several where passengers and workers can reach the second of two major Paris airports. We each got photos of an LRV passing the Concorde supersonic aircraft preserved there. It is painted for Air France on one side and British Airways on the other. We rode back to La Fretanelle stop and then transferred to the C2 line of the RER, which took us over the southern part of the Grand Centure to Massy Palaisur, 
a major SNCF station and junction that also serves TGV trains. Our plan was to continue from there to Versailles Chantier so we could cover the Translore T6 rubber tired guided tram, which we would take back to the city. Unfortunately, we weren't aware that the section of the Grand Centure that it traverses was closed due to the construction of the future T12 express tram route, which is scheduled to open this year. It had started to rain while we were waiting. So instead, we decided to take in the other Translore line, the T5 route on the other side of the city, hoping the precipitation might stop on our long trip across the city to the Gage Sarcel terminal via RER line C and D. It poured heavily during our ride, but began to clear up as we approached our destination. So we were able to photograph the Translaw STE3 cars at their outer terminal in sunlight. The four mile T5 line opened in 2012 and is equipped with 19 small three section bouncy and noisy rubber tired vehicle. Note the single rail. We then rode the line back to the center of Saint Denis and by that time the skies had opened again. This terminal station is perpendicular to the T1 route and Metro line M13 is close by. We've headed back to our hotel from there. I've added photos of the aforementioned T6 and the T2 so that all of Paris's light rails rolling stock is included, again, for the sake of completeness. The T6 uses 28 Translor STE6 cars from 2014, which have six sections compared to the lower capacity three section T3s just seen on the T5. The 8.7 mile long line runs every four to eight minutes. Lastly, photos of a two unit train on the T2 line, which may be the busiest of all the tram routes in the Paris system. The T2 was built over the right of way of a very weak SNCF shuttle electric line like the T4 in 1997. And at first used the same 70% low floor TFS2 cars as the T1. They were transferred to the T1 line after having been replaced by an eventual fleet of 66 Alstom Citadis 302 units, which was built in several batches as needed when the line was extended at both ends and it became necessary to increase capacity by running two car trains. 115,000 passengers per day. The 11 mile line, the 11 mile long line runs every three to five minutes. Park Avenue on the Newark City subway. I will now have to change my, my tray and here. Here we go. Now that we've covered our three days in Paris, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, let's go further afield. On Thursday, the three of us took a day trip by TGV train to Nantes. Nantes, with a population of just under 300,000, is located about 240 miles southwest of Paris. TGV trains from Montparnasse station take some two and a quarter hours to make the trip. The non-rail tra transit system consists of three streetcar lines and two tram train routes. The latter are not true tram trains in my opinion and have much more in common with the express tram lines I just described in Paris than the cause through model. The first started in 2011 to Clisson, about 16 miles to the southeast, runs from the main railway station entirely on SNCF track, mixed in with regular freight and passenger trains. I rode this uninteresting service during my last visit in 2013. The second line 
to Chateaubriand, 40 miles north, was the reason for my trip to the city, as while it too does not share any track with the tramway network, it has a joint station with streetcar route one and parallels it for part of the way, even crossing it at gray. Like the Clisson line, the Chateaubriand service starts at a special low level platform within the mainline station under the SNCF's 25,000 volt AC catenary. Right after the line branches off from other SNCF routes, the voltage of the overhead is changed to 750 DC and it begins to run alongside tram route one, but not on the same right of way, although close enough to share the same road crossings. The roof of the first station, Palaschere Batignol, also covers the tram route, which itself has eight stops along that section. The, the tram trains run nonstop. The two tracks to the far right are used by the tram train. The streetcar is leaving the stop and heading for downtown Nantes. Another view at Halachere Batignol, but on its northern side. This time the tram is approaching the station. Two tracks over to the right, a tram train is shown approaching the station. The current in the overhead is 750 volts DC here, but changes back to 25,000 AC at Babanier, one station further up the line. We rode one of these 24 dual voltage dualis cars for a few stops to Chapelle Center, where we detrained to get a few photos and then to return. We noticed that these dualis cars are equipped with toilets, probably because they run to Chateaubriand, uh, takes over an hour. There are 46 round trips operated on weekdays with only seven covering the entire 40 mile long line. Note the condition of the platform. It poured rain while we were waiting. Fortunately, there was some cover that protected us. The rear of the train is shown as operation on this route is right-handed. Passenger service had originally been discontinued in 1980 and freight service in 2008, only a few years before the line was rebuilt and reopened in 2014. All in all, this tram train line is really a commuter route that employs cost reducing equipment and technology for one man operation. Back at Halosher Batino, this photo shows a Route 1 streetcar crossing the tram train tracks. Route 1 has two branches with one continuing straight alongside the tram train or one more stop to Ranze, the line's current terminal. As you can see, the tram line is being, being extended parallel to the tram train. Now let's talk about the three line streetcar operation. Non-piloted France's light rail revolution like San Diego did in the US and Edmonton in Canada. Even before 70%, much less 100% low floor cars were perfected, not led the way in France with the nation's first light rail line in 1985. Since then, the system has expanded to 28 miles and three lines. There are three generations of LRVs in operation with this type, the original 46 high floor TFS1 cars, having had a low floor middle section added to increase capacity and allow for level bo boarding. Here we see one of the 33 in central cars built in 2000 by Atran which became Bombardier and is now Alstom at the main tram crossing downtown. These diamonds are very busy as lines two and three cross the one at this point. Service is very frequent with LRVs running every three to six minutes on all three lines. Another view at the stop beyond the crossing of one of the 12 new CAF built cars. These Urbos 3s arrived in 2012. Further along on Route 1 with a TFS 1 and with an Incentro. 
On this day, we had ridden the 839 We Go low cost and very crowded TGV down to Nantes and had arrived just before 11. It was a fast run, but the seating and leg room is very tight. After riding the tram train, we didn't have time to cover all three lines and get photos. So we chose the northern end of the two for the remaining time we had. TFS one seemed to be the only type of car on this line and we took a couple of stopovers for photos. It had begun to cloud up, but there was still some sunny intervals. Soon it was time to go back to Paris and we rode the 1740 regular TGV back to Montparnasse, arriving at 1945. Jack, were these pictures taken digital or on film? They look so rich, the colors. Uh, they, these were slides that I took and uh, uh, Duane's in Parsons, Kansas, who processes the film to turn it into slides, also digitized them. Oh, wonderful. I do, John Williams commented, he thought the pictures looked so, the colors looked so rich. So that's why I asked. Thank you. Carl Heinz headed home to the Ruhr today, Thursday. So it was just me and Rich for the rest of the trip. We chose to take a day trip to Cayenne this morning and arrived at Saint Lazare Station in Paris in time for our 8.59 departure aboard a conventional train as that line is not one of the SNCF's many high-speed routes that are served by TGVs. With the forecast being the same as for the last four days, we were hoping for an identical reality, plenty of sunshine with only small interruptions of bad weather. The 150 mile long two hour trip west took exactly two hours, still very good, even if the train could not reach 186 miles per hour. Cayenne is a small city with just over 100,000 souls, but it has a busy two-line light rail system. Its transit history is interesting as the city fathers here were sold a bill of goods at the end of the 20th century and opted to install a rubber tired guided bus system, the TVR from Bombardier. It turned out to be totally unreliable, nor could it handle the demand. The city did not delay action when it realized its mistake, tore out the BRT-like infrastructure after using it for a mere 15 years and replaced it with conventional light rail, virtually over the same 10 miles of route. The 24 guided buses were replaced by 26 Alstom Citadis 305 LRVs with the new system going into service in 2019. Since I had sampled the old one and described it as a failure during my 2009 visit, I was anxious to return to this hilly city in Normandy. Here is a view of an LRV in the city center. Although there are actually three separately numbered routes for all practical purposes with only two branches on either side of downtown, it's a two line system. Each route operates on headways of 10 or 11 minutes. So service is quite frequent through the city center, which is where all three services operate. The track bisects the university's campus. So here is an unusually placid scene. Another one in the same area. The Southern terminus of the T1 is at Jean Villar, shown both today in rain and in TVR days. Cars now reverse after laying over on single track, but previously TVR buses drove around a paved loop. Yes, we had both rainy and cloudy periods, but mostly bright sunlight. Similarly, just north of the city center, Cayenne Chateau, or Norman Castle dating from 1060 and the city's biggest tourist attraction makes a good background for the tramway as it had for the TVR. A pedestrian overpass near the Northern end of Route T1 at Herauville. 
two more contrasting views here looking the other direction. We return to Paris on a similar train at 1657 that afternoon. Friday was getaway day and we checked out of our Paris lodgings and headed to Gare de Lyon for our 739 TGV to head south. At the end of the day, we would be in Nice, some seven hours away by direct high speed train, but we were going to interrupt our travel day by stopping over in Avignon to ride and photograph its new tramway. Now for the first time, the weather forecast was for sunny skies, typical for the south of France. Our train arrived at Avignon TGV on the advertised at 1019, giving us enough time to leave our bags there, or so we thought, as the SNCF website indicated there was a left luggage office. But no, there wasn't. Our connecting EMU for the city center, where the tramway is, was going to leave soon, so we decided to take our bags and board it and hope for the best. To make a long story short, we kept being directed to nearby places that we were told would hold our baggage for a price and eventually actually did find one. Its staff was quite professional and it only took moments for them to take the luggage and give us receipts so now we could get down to business. Avignon, some 420 miles south of Paris, is rather large with a population of 475,000, but it only has one short streetcar line, which opened in 2019. And it actually doesn't go through the main part of the city. The most striking structure in the city is, is its ramparts, a fortress-like stone wall surrounding much of the old urban area, which was built in the 14th century. The fortifications run past the railway station and command a great view of the Rhone River, which flows through the city. Alstom built 14 of the Citadis 205 for operation on the 3.3 mile line. The inner terminal is but one stop from the station and as you can see, has no retaining bumper block. Going the other way, the line goes through an old neighborhood on narrow streets. It then traverses a pleasant leafy area. And here is the outer terminal at St. Chamond. NIMBY's made the line controversial at its outset and the long-term plan has been reduced, but there should be a line two coming extending counterclockwise along the fortifications, but not into the historic city center. Service runs every six to nine minutes. One last view of the iconic ramparts of Avignon. Again, and I seem to, my escape button does not seem to be working. And I don't know what to do at this point to get to my next reel. Um, it worked. Okay. Good. Very good. So <laughs> give me a moment to change reels. And we will continue. Friday was getaway day and we checked out of our Paris lodgings and headed to Gare de Lyon for our 739 TGV to head south. At the end of the day, we would be in Nice, some seven hours away by direct high-speed train. And I mentioned that before. So we were reversed our ride out, of, out to the TGV station and then took the 1353 TGV to Marseille which arrived at 1423, giving us about a half hour to transfer to the 1457 TER regional train that took us to Nice St. Augustine, a suburban stop near the airport of this Mediterranean city where we would stay in a local chain hotel. The reason we picked this location was that both of the city's new tram lines stopped close by. 
Nice is France's sixth largest city with a population of about 850,000 within its boundaries and over 1 million in its metropolitan area. It is 550 miles south, southeast of Paris. And as I mentioned before, we travel by train in under seven hours. The tram system consists of three lines, the first opening in 2007 and the other two following in 2018 and 2019. The network is about 16 miles in length and is notable for its extensive use of wireless technology, which is based on char chargeable batteries rather than the APS system that Alstone pioneered. Because of the technology of the time, most of line one is equipped with overhead wire. There are 28 Alstom Citadis 100% low floor 302 and 402 LRVs running on the original Route 1. As you can see in this view, they're painted silver. All of them came as five section 302s in two batches. The 16 highest numbered route units were lengthened to seven sections starting in 2013, thus becoming Citadis 402. Note that these are also identifiable by the 11, the yellow smile on their ends. A third view shows both types under overhead wire. The area through Place Messina and Place Garibaldi are the only ones on Route 1 that are wireless. I think you can see why the city did not want overhead comprising this iconic view. The cars charge their batteries through their pantographs after they're lifted to the wire section. Route two is much more up to date. In addition to running through a two mile subway, over 80% of its route is wireless. Here is a view at Port Olympia, the line's Eastern terminal, at the end of the subway. While the cars on Route 1 charge their batteries when their pantographs are touching the overhead, those on the new lines are equipped with lithium ion capacitors, which can be fully charged in under 20 seconds from plates between the rails at stops. Wi Fi is used for communication between the rolling stack, stock, and the charging plates to start and end the process. This map shows the system. Note that line two is underground when it crosses line one at the Jean Medicine station. And here's the subway portion. And here is the crossing and also crosses the line at Garibaldi later. It is very deep and it takes a few minutes to transfer from one line to the other. Also notice the split end terminal for route two. Three more views at the Port Olympia terminal, a most photogenic spot. Cars on route two are scheduled to run every five minutes or less during most of the day. Here's the western portal of the subway from the Centro Universitaire stop. No graffiti. For some reason, irrigation of the grass appears to have been out of service on this short portion of Route 2 along Rue de France. But not this one. What a contrast. Approaching the Park Phoenix stop, a half block from our hotel. No need for airport bus shuttles serving the plethora of hotels in the St. Augustine neighborhood. The two splits at the Grand Arena stop where one branch heads for the airport along with Route 3 from the north. This view from a street overpass shows the start of the traffic free approach to the terminal. As does this one, which emphasize the area's modernistic buildings. The two and three have separate platforms at the airport. This is the threes with the twos being to the right 
under the canopy and thus a bit closer to check-in and baggage claim facilities. Now to route three. This line doesn't much go anywhere at the moment. Perhaps it was built to encourage the development. Some plan stations have yet to be constructed as their locations are now in the middle of nowhere. Service runs on the three only every 13 or 14 minutes compared with three to five minute frequencies on route two. The existing housing is brand new and the charging plates are very prominent in this view. Stada, one station short of the outer terminal. Interestingly, the final station, St. Isidore, is only a five minute walk from the station of the same name on the diesel operated meter gauge line from Nice to Dean Le Bain. But they are at different altitudes, and passengers making this connection would have to climb a huge number of steps. All of them shown here where my cursor is on the right. Definitely not appropriate for an 85 year old like me. And here is a photo of the narrow gauge line near its St. Isidore stop. Excuse me while I take a drink of water. On Sunday, we actually rode that line with the highlight being pulled by a steam locomotive for part of the excursion. This is the facade of the Chaman de Fer Provence station in downtown Nice, but it's now only just a wall. The station was torn down in 1991 and a smaller Morostia terminal was built a block further back. The CF de Provence, also known as the Tren de Pine, pine trees, runs for a distance of about 93 miles climbing into the mountains of Southern France, known locally as the High Alps of Provence. The railroad dates back to the first decade of the 20th century. There are 27 tunnels with the highest elevation reach being 3,356 feet. The railroad operates two services, both provided by diesel rail cars, a local one through Colomars, five miles away, and a long distance one covering the entire line. Right now, 31 round trips are operated with suburban commuters with an average running time of 26 minutes with stops, while four are scheduled to run the full distance, which takes some three and a half hours. At present, the last 30 miles is operated by bus because this section of the line is being rebuilt. The Colomar station is five miles away from the center of Nice by rail, but twice that distance by road due to the roundabout route necessary because of the steep grade. Here are two suburban trains laying over in the new terminal. And here is the long distance unit we ended up riding in. It is heading for the platform after having been fueled for the full run. We left at 9.20 a.m. In addition to riding the line to enjoy the scenery, we were also planning to patronize the steam train, which is operated on Sundays by the GECP, a rail fan organization. Here it is at Pouget Sanier, the starting point of the excursion of the steam powered. After a scrum at one doors of the deep modern diesel rail car, we rode it as far as this point, arriving at 1044, having covered some 36 miles for a round trip fare of 23 euros. The 246T tank engine was built in 1923 by Henschel for Portuguese railways. In European nomenclature, it's known as a 1BCT. I had made reservations and bought tickets for the steam excursion from the GECP's website, also at a price of 23 euros. And we had reserved seats in this antique, antique piece of rolling stock. Note the area outside the body of the car. I'm referring to this 
and the, the reservation form indicated the choice of interior or exterior. Fortunately, I picked the latter, which turned out to be a good choice on this warm, sunny day. This appeared to be the most modern of the coaches pulled by our steam locomotive. The almost sold out train was filled almost entirely with families as opposed to rail fans. This view is at Puget Sanier, just prior to the whistle indicating all aboard at 11 a.m. We were surprised that two photo stops were made, both on the outward journey. One was at Entrevaux, a tourist town with some religious sites, and the other here at Pont de Gudin, where a flea market was in progress. Here's some of the scenery viewed from the train along the river Var. The steam trip covered 13 more miles ending at Anno, normally a half hour journey on a regular train, but because of the photo stops, it took just short of an hour and 30 minutes. The DMU that paused here at 1230, which was headed toward, back toward Nice is one of four AMP 800s the railway bought from a company called CFD Bonnier around 2010. While most of the passengers walked to the center of Anno to partake in lunch, we stayed around to photograph the reversing of the locomotive on the turntable. There were only about a half dozen other photographers among us, but one managed to get into this third picture. So we showed reversing it back, approaching the turntable, being pushed, and reversing again back to the platform. Here's our train all set up to receive passengers for the return journey. But before we left another revenue rail car, this time heading up the line from Nice, stopped for passengers. It was now 14.52, some 30 minutes before our return departure at 15.30. Finally, a view into the sun back at puget Fenier, where we bid farewell to steam and rode back to Nice. We arrived just before 1800. It was a great day. The destination of our next day was Marseille, some 120 miles west of Nice, and our locus for the exploration of the new tramway in Aubonne. Um, but also for catching up with the new developments in France's third largest city. It was now Tuesday and we were back to weather forecasts of rain. Aubagne has a population of about 45,000 and until 1958 was at the outer end of one of Marseille's streetcar lines. I can't help comparing the characteristics of Aubagne to the town I live in, Montclair, New Jersey. The population is close about 45,000. And the distance to the nearest large city is just a bit smaller, seven miles versus 13. And we too had a streetcar line from, in our case, from Newark, which quit in 1952, six years earlier than Obanya's initial system. Anyway, here's a photo of the EMU that we rode to Aubagne from St. Charles, the main railroad station in Marseille. It took us about 20 minutes to get there. And we found the new tram line with ease. It opened in 2014, is about one and three quarter miles long and uses a fleet of eight Citadas compact cars, the 205s, just like Avignon. Aubagne is very fond of its LRT line and has planned to extend it to open in 2025. It will then become more like an interurban with a nine mile extension over a disused rail line to La Boulie d'Az and will be called the Valfram. Service is frequent on this line and no fares are charged. 
This view is obviously at the line's inner terminal at the railroad station. I didn't know exactly how to describe the LRV's color scheme. Some say it's modern art, while others have rationalized it as, quote, brightly colored monsters designed to frighten small children as part of the safety program. I leave it to you. Here are some views along the relatively short line. The blue sky seen in the first photo gradually began to cloud over as we rode and photographed. It rained while we were traveling back to Marseille and it was overcast while we searched out the tram system's newest extension. Marseille is the only city we visited on this trip that has upgraded a legacy tramway. The other 25 cities having light, have totally new light rail systems. Marseille's population is 1.6 million and it has a rubber tired Metro with two lines. It's 400, it is 475 miles south of Paris and a trip by TGV takes three and a half hours. We rode Metro line M2 to its end at Castellane where we found the Southern end of the tramway, tramway route three the most recent extension to Marseille's light rail system. With the coming of the tram line in this section of the city in 2015, motor traffic is virtually banned from the Rue de Rome. And with sidewalks having been widened, it is now a pleasant place for entertainment and shopping. A Bombardier built LRV is shown in the narrow street. Another view showing one of Marseille's Flexity Outlook cars at the T3's Place de Rome stop. These LRVs were substantially customized on Bordier, which attempted to de design the vehicle to look like the hull of a ship with the operator's cab resembling the bow. 15 more LRVs that will look like these will join the current fleet of 46 and they've just been ordered from CAF. Before going on, here is a view from the internet of an MU pair of Marseille's legacy PCC cars. A fan trip with one of these 21 1968 built units was part of the ERA's excursion to Southern Europe in 1988. This line, formerly Route 68, was retained because it entered the city center through this 1893 built trolley subway used by trains propelled by steam until 1904. And so it became the centerpiece when Marseille's modern LRT system was introduced in 2007. At that time, the tunnel was converted to single track because of clearance issues. And it is now part of the inner part of Route T1. For more views of the T3, this time highlighting its upper portion and the sun came out. The package here was built as part of the reintroduction of trams in 2007. This portion of the system was originally used by T2 cars, but is now shared with the T3. The tramway has now expanded to 10 miles in length. Two final views of Marseille streetcars on what could be considered an extension of Route 68 eastward beyond its old terminal at the car house. The T1 traverses a very hill, hilly section of the city at its new outer end. The scenes shown here were all near the Air Bell stop. On Wednesday morning, we left Marseille with our luggage on the 710 TGV for Lyon, France's second city. We originally planned to be aboard the 810 for the two hour, 35 minute ride, but the SNCF ticket vending machine I used on my arrival in France some nine days earlier indicated that it was fully booked, sold out. When planning the trip, we decided to use France's flexible senior rail passes 
for our transportation to save money. But after buying the pass, I couldn't get any my laptop to make and pay for reservations. Fortunately, I was able to get reservations for all the other TGVs we planned to ride. So this was the only disappointment we had. But it really turned out well, as it gave us one more hour to ride the Lyon streetcar system. Since we were continuing to the Paris area later in the day, we had to find a place to stow our luggage. But unlike in Avignon, we were successful this time discovering such an office inside the Part Dieu station. Lyon, located 275 miles southeast of Paris and two hours away by TGV, lies at the confluence of the Rhone and Seine River. Just under 1.8 million people live in the region. Like Paris, it has a robust rail transit system, in this case, with seven streetcar lines, two funiculars, four metro lines, including one operated by cable, three tram train lines, and most interestingly, an express tramway to its airport. Plus, for those who love rubber tires, a nine-line trolleybus system. I visited this city on multiple occasions, the last having been almost a decade ago in 2013. So it did not surprise me that there have been a number of extensions since then. The main order of business then for me was to see what was new. The weather prediction was rain, and so my disappointment with the skies upon our arrival in this case was expected. The first line on my list was the T1. Here an LRV crosses the Rhone River on a brand new 2014 bridge south of the Parash railway station. But look at the sky. Maybe there was some hope. Next on my list was the T6 from Diborg to Hospital Espinel, which came in 2019. The Lyon streetcar system is five, 45 miles in length and its roster consists of 107 100% low floor Alstom Citadis units, 73 five section 302 cars from 2000 when the system was inaugurated, followed by 34 402s with seven sections in 2012. Lyon has stayed with its unique and controversial hyperbolic end styling with modest changes from the beginning. Then over to the T5 for the run to your expo, a line that had been only used for transportation to special events until 2020. It shares some track with the T2, which we photographed just east of De Jeannette, a major junction of routes T2, T5, and T6. The right of way shared by the T2 and the T5 through here is next to a bicycle path and along the side of a big campus containing several hospitals. The ride to your expo was interesting as there was a strong long stretch with no stops alongside a golf course in the middle of nowhere where our LRV really got up to good speed. The terminal is wide open with a long platform. That completed the required writing that I had planned. And so I spent the rest of the day showing Richard my favorite lines. Note that the blue sky we saw crossing the Rhone was finally catching up with us way to the east of downtown. We rode back to the Grange Blanche metro station, the western terminal of the T5, which shares trackage with the T2 at this point. Transferring to Metro Line D there, we rode a rubber tired subway train to a southern terminal at Gare de Venisseur, where the platforms are nicely sunlit. Met the Metro operates left handed in Lyon, but notice that there's no operator the line being fully automated, which gives passengers who like to look out the front of trains, like you know who, a most enjoyable ride. <laughs> the T4 running south from Gare de Venisseur to Hospital Fezan Venisseur is very photogenic, operating past many new residential structures. 
here we came across the first two variations on Leon's all white livery. Two versions with red stripes, one also reaching the ends of the cars. We rode back to the Park Juice railway station where we had arrived on a T4 car and came across one of the same units we photographed before, ready to make an outbound trip. We took more photos here and saw two more variations on the Leon livery, one silver and the other very busy with headlights looking like the eyes of someone with a slip personality. <laughs> the third track at this station serves the trams of the Rhone Express, an extra fare limited stop service that runs to St. Exbury Airport, where in addition to flights, there is a station for TGV trains from north and south of Lyon. The cost to ride these limiteds is rather high. So in 2013, Claire and I rode a TGV from Paris to the airport and then continued into the city on the fast LRT line. So we only had to pay for a one-way ride. The one-way price is 1630, which is still plenty, but better than the 2830 round trip. The Rhone Express's LRVs follow streetcar line T3 out to Maiseur, a distance of 9.3 miles, and then continue on their own tracks for 5.3 more miles to the airport terminal. The trip takes a half hour and service operates every 15 minutes in each direction. With a local T3 line running every seven to nine minutes, the inner portion of the route is very busy. It originally constituted the tracks of the Chemin de Fer de l'Est de Lyon, CFEL, a standard gauge secondary rail line which ceased passenger service in 1947 and was fully abandoned in 2003. Its railroad heritage is reflected by the route's ballasted tracks because most of the Lyon tram network PRW is actually grassed in. Several stops have passing tracks to allow the Rhone Express LRVs to pass regular L Leon T3 lines while they pause for passengers. I covered that aspect of the line in great deal in my presentation in 2013, as well as the tram train operation on the other side of the city that like Nantes is confined to SNCF railroad track. But there is also a new streetcar line out on the T3 towards the airport, the T7 to the Seines Eau Valley, which went into service in 2021. It has very little right of way of its own running along the T3 and Rhone Express from the Metro Line A terminal at Ve de Vellan to the Seines Grand Lodge, where it then turns south to serve a major new shopping center and various sports venues. It has its own platform at the Metro station where cars can lay over waiting for departure time. Another view at roughly the same spot with a T7 car heading outbound toward the airport. The stop for the T3 and Rhone Express is behind the photographer. Further back from the main platform, showing a Rhone Express car on the center express tracks. And at its platform, showing an inbound Rhone, Rhone Express unit. Passengers from the airport have to cross the inbound T3 track on foot to reach the Metro. The Rhone Express has a roster of six Sadler Tango LRVs built in 2010 for the inauguration of what has turned out to be a very successful service. Here are two views of the shared T3, T7, and Rhone Express right of way, just east of the Dessine Center stop. Just beyond the Meizu ZI stop, showing the Rhone Express right of way at the left running to the airport. Three more here. The T3 tracks this time are on the inside while the airport trains use the outside rails. These photos show some of the unique liveries applied 
to the Citatus 402s, pardon me. The T3 turns off here to reach its nearby terminal of Maisur le Panet, where the crossovers shown leads to an island platform. To the left are the tracks that lead to the shops of the Rhone Express. The local systems car house and shop complex is located one stop before the end of the line. An inbound Rhone Express LRV on the straightaway beyond Meizu, where they can reach their inbound, their speed potential of 65 miles per hour with the remaining, remaining 5.3 miles of their run, which is scheduled, scheduled to take nine minutes. We leave Leon back at Part Du, where I finally was able to photograph three trams together at the car stop, right before we bailed out our luggage prior to our boarding the 1700 TGV for De Gaulle Airport for our final two overnights. After arriving at 1902, a ride on the Val People Mover got us to within a few, within a few yards of our hotel. Pardon me while I take another sip. Thursday was our last full day of rail fanning in France, and we chose to make the climax a day trip to Le Mans to cover that streetcar system, which I've added a second line since my visit in 2009. We rode the 848 TGV from De Gaulle Airport and arrived at our destination at 1029. The weather forecast was for a mixed bag of sun, clouds, and rain, but fortunately the emphasis turned out to be on the first. Famous for its annual sports car race, Le Mans has a population of 150,000 and a streetcar system that covers some 11 miles. Established in 2007, much of its trackage is in grass center reservation, like most of the networks in France. The 34 rust colored Citadis 302s from 2007 contrast smartly with the ground covering. 23 were built for the opening and 11 followed in 2013 for the 2014 extension. An LRV lays over at the northern terminal of Route E2 at Bellevue Hort de Colain on the newest section of line. Further toward the city center lies Le Mans' most significant ecclesiastical site, the 12th century Jacobin's Cathedral, also known as St. Julian's. Two views of the combined section of line through downtown. Note the attractive red brick paving on Main Street, Avenue du General Leclerc. We rode back to Charles de Gaulle from Le Mans aboard the 1531 TGV, arriving at 1713. Here's a photo of our train right after it pulled into the airport's TGV station. The last photo from the trip is of the airport's valve circulator system that took us back to our hotel. However, as a postscript, upon our arrival, we found out that there was going to be an air controller strike the next day when we were scheduled to fly on United to Newark and Chicago, respectively. We soon inquired further and found out that my flight was going to proceed, but Richards was canceled. And the earliest he could get another seat was on Sunday, two days later. I breathed a sigh of relief. <laughs> Can't say that Richard did. On Friday morning, I found the airport to be almost totally deserted. I got through security in about a minute since there were no lines, but Richard was not so lucky. First, he had to change hotels at his expense as ours was sold out for the next two evenings. He later got a nice credit from United, however. And on Saturday though, he was able to ride and photograph the T4 tram train on his own schedule. This concludes the French portion of the program. Give me another moment and I will 
change reels again. And take a sip. Jack, do you want a, a short intermission or do you want to go right in? No, I think we'll go right in because I have a lot to continue. No problem. On. Just thought I'd ask. All right. So yes, everybody... I appreciate you thinking of that. Yeah, well, actually, Andrew Ludasi thought of it. So I'll give him the credit. So, okay, very good. Charge on. Now let's go back a few months further to May of this past year. I saw an announcement that the Musée de Tram in Brussels would be celebrating its 40th anniversary on Sunday, May 22nd, and would go all out with operating its fleet of heritage streetcars on that date over tram routes 39 and 44, which passed by the museum. In fact, it would take over the operation of all tram service to Traveren and Stockholm for seven hours on that date, using heritage cars from its large collection. Unfortunately, I was unable to participate in another gala electric elect railway event in Brussels three years earlier in May 29th, 2019, which many ERA members attended, and thus was so pleased that the opportunity to ride and photograph streetcars dating back to the 19th century would come along again. Being a little wary of travel at the time that COVID restrictions were just starting to be lifted, I chose to go to Belgium for only four days, a long weekend, and quickly made a hotel reservation. I even got two friends, Andrew Beach from Britain and Karl Heinz Rober from Germany to join me. And as it happened, met quite a few other fellow traction enthusiasts from past trips there as well. In addition to visiting Brussels, we would make day trips to Antwerp and Ghent over this weekend. Unfortunately, the photo forecast indicated mostly <laughs> bad weather for each of the days I would be in Belgium, except miraculously for the main event on Sunday where it would be sunny and warm. And as it turned out, a perfect day for riding and photography. And on the other days, I was lucky that there were moments when the sun actually peeked out from behind the clouds and shone between the raindrops. I chose to use United Frequent Flyer points to pay for the round trip. And it turned out that the best deal I could get involved flying on Brussels Airlines from JFK with a return on United to Newark, costing me relatively few points. So we'll start with a view of the Port Authority's air train at JFK. Getting to that airport is usually a hop, skip, and a jump from Montclair via NJ Transit to Penn Station, the Long Island Railroad or E train to Jamaica, and then the air train. Fortunately, the delay when the portal bridge opened in front of my New Jersey Transit train lasted only 13 minutes but I'm still annoyed at why the Port Authority's computer system cannot be programmed to de deduct the unconscionable air train fare of $8 from my senior Metro card. The Airbus 330 was about half full, so it was very comfortable for me as I was able to spread out over two seats. Arrival in the rain was on time at eight o'clock on Friday, May 20th, and despite the need to prove having been vaccinated, movement through customs and immigration was quick and easy. It is interesting to note that as of the next day, May 21st, the vaccination requirement for entry into Belgium was lifted. Booking.com had a deal that provided free taxi service to the hotel from the airport, so I took advantage of that. Without that perk, I would have had to ride an airport train and then transfer to the Metro. I suspect I didn't save that much time. And in any case, I would have found my hotel not ready to provide me with a room so early in the morning. The Hotel Derby, or is it pronounced Darby, is one subway or tram stop away from Place Montgomery, a major transit center with both trams and metro trains running underground, but with one line, the 81, operating on the surface. The hotel looks out onto the tracks of the 81, but unfortunately my room was not at the front. 
I held off on photographing the trams on that route because of the rain. And after leaving my bags in the hotel's luggage room, purchased a ride at will day ticket at the Maroda subway station and began riding the system with an emphasis on what was new since my previous visit. First on my list was Route 9, which now runs from an underground terminal at the Simoni Metro Station in a northwesterly direction to Roi Boisdouin. That line was created in 2018 and was extended to its new terminal just under six months before my trip in November 2021. As you can see, the trackage is on center reservation, which is typical for most routes outside the city center. The Brussels system consists of about 17 tram lines running over roughly 88 miles of track, or I should say route, with as busy as two routes running through a pre-metro subway that is in the process of being converted to a heavy metro line. The sub and outer terminal of the nine is at Roi Badouin. On my first trip to Europe in 1960, the local tramway network in Brussels was predominantly served by single-ended cars with new La Bourgeois built PCCs still arriving for its modern fleet. But around 1973, the operator, the STIB, decided to go to double-ended equipment. The last PCC cars, double-ended articulators, were delivered to Brussels in 1978. And it wasn't until 1993 that the STIB began receiving its next order of cars, consisting of a new fleet of 100% low-floor articulated units from Bombardier the Canadian company that in 1988 purchased La Bourgeois at Nivelle. BN built PCCs for tram systems in the Netherlands, Belgium and France and Yugoslavia starting in 1950 and continuing until 1984. The first Bombardier delivered units to the STIB were 51 three section T2000. The two cars shown here are among 155 section flexity outlook units in the T3000 series, which began arriving in 2005. The shorter T2000 were not terribly successful and were delivered during a period when the future of the tram system was under debate. The outer terminal of heavy Metro Route 6 is also at Roi Badouin. It is one of four such routes that ushered in Brussels' heavy metro era in 1970. Only one stop away is the three-track terminal of tram route seven at Hazel. As can be seen, the terminal is in sight of the Atomium, the iconic structure that defined the Brussels World Fair of 1958. Pictured here is one of the STIB's 70 seven section T4000 series cars, a longer version of the T3000, also a Bombardier Flexity Outlook product. One stop down the line is the junction of the seven and 19 tram lines, also in view of the Atomium, which today houses a museum and arts center and even a restaurant. Designed to last only six months, its destruction was delayed and delayed until the structure was finally made permanent as the city leaders came to realize that it had become Brussels' most popular tourist attraction. It stands 335 feet tall and its six visible spheres are connected by stairs and escalators. Another 4,000 series car is shown in this view. It soon began to rain rather heavily and I headed back to the hotel where I found my room to be ready and grabbed a few winks, but I napped only for a short period, hoping to combat jet lag. I couldn't let, let the rest of the day go by without more tram riding. So I headed out to an extension of Route 94, now Route 8, that opened in 2018 in the far Eastern outskirts of the city. It rained while I was riding, but when I reached the terminal at Rodebeck, it had held, it had let up a little bit. 
The extension is also on center of the road reservation, although some portions run through a very wide swath of side of the road greenery. Here is a 3000 series cars, car in the rain. Staying with Brussels, Sunday dawned bright and sunny and remained that way all day. Andrew was rooming elsewhere and we had set up a meeting point near the hotel for 1030, a half hour before the anniversary festivities would begin. We didn't want to waste any sunshine, so Carl Hans and I decided to travel to the museum to observe what preparations might be underway. We rode a 39 or 44 car from their underground loop at Montgomery for about four stops and seeing only a modicum of activity began photographing regular service, which was provided on those lines by six axle high floor articulated PCC cars in the 7700, 7800 series. The switch from traditional four axle PCCs to articulated units in Brussels started in late 1971 with the delivery of the single ended 7500 series. The double-ended 7800s came in 1973, and less than a decade later, the 7500s were converted from single to double-end. That began in 1988-81, with the 7700s becoming virtually identical to the 7800s. In fact, today's car 7723 was originally numbered 7830. Here is outbound Route 39 car 7804 at the Tram Museum stop early that morning. The track on the right is used by outbound Route 8 cars on their way to Rotebank. This view of outbound car 7801 on Route 44 is from a pedestrian overpass above Avenue de Tavern. The leads connecting the museum with the STIB network are shown at right. We would come back here after the festival was well underway for photos of heritage cars and a visit to the museum itself to view static exhibits. This is a map put out by the museum showing the operation of the heritage trams. We retraced our st steps back from the museum to Maroda, where we would meet Andrew. We returned via the 3944 to an, the underground stop at Montgomery and then walked along the continuation of Avenue de Tavern for a short distance, one tram or a subway stop to our meeting point across the street from our hotel, which was right adjacent to the Marada station. The 81 tram terminates on the surface of Montgomery where there are also connecting tracks, which is right here to the 39 and 44 normally used for equipment moves. The 81 turns off Avenue de Tavern about over here and heads this way, right. right in front of our hotel. Heritage cars on a route the museum called the BE would be sharing the rails of that section of the 81 for this short distance and riding and photographing here was the first activity we planned for the day. But first a look at Route 81 in that area. Number 3092 is approaching its terminal at Montgomery on Sunday morning, presumably waiting for an inbound to leave before entering the loop. Parc du Cinquantenaire with its memorial arch is in the background. And you can see that over here. Formerly a Miller's military exercise ground, it was converted to an exhibition area in 1880. As will be seen shortly, the heritage trams started from a stub track at the end of Avenue de Tavern at the side of the park. This stop is right in front of our hotel. Route 81 turns to the southwest onto Avenue de la Chasse here. Car 7911 is one of the last order or Brussels PCCs, of which 61 were delivered from La Brousoise in 1977 and 1978. The eight axle high floor cars are double-ended, but will be re 
but will be replaced as more 3000s and 4000s actually to be numbered in the 3200s and 4200s are added to the roster in forthcoming years, which will sadly end the PCC era. Here is the re rear of PCC 7939, turning southward from Avenue de Traveren to Avenue de la Chasse at that point. The tracks to the right are a remnant from the days before the Traveren and Stockholm Stockholm lines were cut back at Montgomery. And until then, they continued into the tram subway that was eventually converted to Metro Line 1. And that's the track that, that you see over here. They would be used today to turn heritage cars as part of the museum's anniversary celebration. Here's number 3126 taking the curve at that same point. Now for the festival. Number 428 must have deadheaded to the Marotta end of the festival route BE before our arrival. It had already changed ends and was waiting for time before picking up passengers heading for Montgomery. This four wheeler was one of 105 motor cars built in 1903 for the newly electrified Chemin de Fer Economique, an STIB predecessor. Its platforms were, were not protected by glass windscreens and outside lighting was provided by simple oil lamps when the car was delivered. But it was updated at some point before it was decommissioned in 1935. The 346 came to the Economique at the same time as the 428 in 1903 and also in the same quantity, 105. However, these cars contained both an open and a closed section. Naturally, as you can imagine, they were nicknamed California cars. Because of Belgian winters, the series didn't last past 1928. The 346 is shown at the turnback point, a few feet from the location of the previous photo. Hardly any passengers got off prior to its return trip to Montgomery. Heading for Maroda on its next trip, the 428 is shown being passed by number 3096 in regular Route 81 service. The contrast couldn't be any greater. Well, it probably would have been had the photo not been taken with the camera looking into the sun. The signage for our hotel, the Derby, appears in the left background and you can see it up here. Upon riding aboard the 2428 back to Montgomery, we found it was using the same loop as the cars heading eastward on the two festival lines to Tervuren and Sockel. Number 7171 was the last traditional PCC built for Brussels, having been constructed in 1971 and ending a series that began with car 7001 20 years earlier. It is part of the final group of 16 that were constructed atop trucks of PCC cars that had operated in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Back to the same map. And let me take a drink. Yeah. Now it was time to concentrate on the 31 and 40, which were both running every 15 minutes. And here is the 31, and here is the 40. Earlier, when at the museum stop, Karl Heinz had run into a friend from Germany who gave him an extra copy of the operating schedule of the day, which showed each departure, destination, and car assignment. It was an indication of how well choreographed the operation would be and confirmed the excellent frequency of the service. The 40 was running in lieu of the regular Route 44 and its normal patrons were forced to ride the beautiful historic cars. Similarly, the 31 was running instead of the 39, the turning at the loop at Stockholm, and that's right over here, which had been the end of the line upon my first visit to Brussels in 1960. 
Heritage equipment with trolley poles ran out to Tervuren, while those running to Stockholm were equipped with panographs that were also historically correct. The 30 bus using historic rubber tired equipment was operating over the balance of the 39, which is shown here, while STIB Route 160 was running with modern equipment over the entirety of the 39, plus supplementing the regular Route 8, not shown on the map, to Rotabeek. So the 8 comes up from here and goes up to Rotabeek. And the 160 was running between Vost and Van Eyck. Our first destination would be Vote, where we would take a look at a steam tram. We rode to that point in a regular Route 8 car from the museum stop. <clears throat> steam tram number eight would puff back and forth from there to the Voluva shopping stop, where we guessed other members of the public would be examining it as well. Meanwhile, Route 8 ran single track with its cars in platoons over the distance between crossovers. Here's a side view of number eight. Russell's steam tram operation took place only from 1885 to 1891. This tram was built by Cockerell in 1890. After it became surplus, it was sold to the Vicinal and later ended up on various industrial railways. In 1987, it was transported to Great Britain and was restored by members of the North Yorkshire Moors Railway from which it was borrowed for these festivities. Four-wheeler number 1376 was placed on the steam trams track to support its crew during the festival. This car, one of 685 TB or tramway Roussois standards were built, was built in 1936. The TB was the predecessor of the SDIB which was created to take over the privately owned company when its concession expired in 1945. Actually, the turnover didn't occur until January 1st, 1954. The TB standards ran <clears throat> on the streets of the city until the late 1980s. <clears throat> Eleven of them were sold to Asuncion, Paraguay, where they ran until 1985, and almost a dozen are in the U.S., with at least six at the Oregon Electric Railway Museum in Brooks, Oregon, which will be visited at this summer's ERA convention. A few came via Orlando's Grand Cypress Hotel, and others are, in, are at the National Capitol Trolley Museum outside of Washington, D.C., and in Tucson, Arizona. From Fault, we returned to the museum on a Route 8 car and then rode the next Route 41 heritage tram all the way out to Tervuren. Paralleling Avenue de Tervuren, or called Tervuren Lawn, after we entered the Flemish suburbs of Brussels. This is Brussels' prettiest line, running through shaded parks and forests among trees for about six miles to its terminal loop. I could have taken this photo of 1952 built PC car 7047 just as easily in 1960 when I rode the line for the first time. I haven't looked at my slides from that trip lately, but I wonder if I have one of the 7047 on that line. It is shown leaving the loop and heading back towards the city. Here's a slide of its cousin, former Bur Brussels PCC 7037, operating on the F line at San Francisco's Pier 39 in Zurich colors. We then rode various heritage cars to intermediate stations for photographs. Number 5025 is shown at Brussels Steinbeck, two stations in from the loop. 
while the company was still building standard four-wheelers in the mid-1930s. It also ordered 25 larger cars to haul the crowds expected for the 1935 World's Fair, also located in the area where the Atomium was later built. These were its first modern double truck units, although their wooden bodies looked like lengthened versions of the TB standard cars. These cars carried passengers until 1976. I rode in them many times during those days and found them to be very peppy and comfortable. Many became work cars afterwards, and as a result, six of the series were preserved by the Tram Museum, with the 5025 being restored to its original appearance. Not so for number 5018 of the same series, shown at Opernstraat, one station in from the terminal. In the late 1940s, Brussels was looking to update its fleet and considered adopting the body styles of American PCC cars or of modern Swiss standard units. The latter style won out and various 5,000 series cars were given slightly different versions of the Swiss body. Five of the 5,000s ended up being rebuilt that way between 1949 and 1952. And the first, number 5018, may have actually been the prototype for the body styling of the 172 double truck PCCs Brussels bought from La Bourgeois. They never received new electrical equipment or center, center doors, however. Not a scrunched up telephoto shop of a PCC or a modern 5000 series car. <laughs> This short tram is one of 101 9,000 series four-wheelers built starting in 1959 from the oldest of the TB standard units. Hardly anything was new, certainly not the truck or electrical equipment other than their streamlined bodies. They were used on Brussels most lightly traffic lines. Another view of number 9098, this time showing the door side. A modern articulated PCC? Hardly, but I thought so until I boarded one over a half century ago. The streamlined styling? Yes, but nothing else. <laughs> These two rooms in the bath units were slow, noisy, and bumpy, and this was why. Each of the 43 cars in the series was built by joining a standard motor and a trailer to the opposite ends of a shortly of a short, newly manufactured suspended center section. They were fabricated between 1963 and 1967 for heavier lines that were being operated with motor trailer sets, those, bu those busier than the ones being served by the 9,000. Thus their construction was a cost-saving cost move to eliminate the need for a second employee aboard. Plus, there was a staffing shortage at that time as well. Similar cars to the Moeller trailer latch up behind number 4032 in this view were used in this transformation. My friend and travel companion described the 4000s better than I could as, quote, dreadful, the nadir of Br Brussels tram design. Here's a close up view of the motor vehicle of the motor trailer set shown in the last slide near the Tramway Museum. Number 1609 was one of the last single truck TB standards built in 1938, the same time when PCC cars were being manufactured in the United States. It is shown pulling matching trailers 604 from 1931. Now for a couple of more views of motors pulling trailers. Here's number 1259, a TB standard from 1936 with an open trailer called Balladeuse by the local population. Almost 400 were constructed by various car builders for use in the summer. The dictionary translation of that word is portable lamp, but I think the expression wandering light might, be, might better define the open, open trailers. An even older motor, 
number 1348 from 1923, also pulling an open trailer. And a close up view of open bench trailer 301 that was built in 1901. A side view of trailer 244, an even older beauty built back in 1897 and certainly representative of the Bell Epoch. Four wheel car 830 from 1901. This is from one of the first series of electric trams built for the TB. Eventually cars of this type were replaced by the standards in the 1930s although some remained on the roster as trailers as late as the 1950s. Number 1750 from 1914 actually spent a good part of its life assigned to the Tavern line. These were the first cars to be in Brussels iconic yellow livery, replacing the harder to see green in that year. Modified throughout their lifetimes, these units remained in use until 1957. Number 1750 was restored to its World War I appearance with its oil lamps adopted to run on electricity. Now over to the Stockel line, which was running as Route 31 for the festival with Panagraph equipped trams. Unmodified since it was removed from passenger service in 1976, number 5016 is shown approaching the junction with the Traveran line. The 31 or 39 runs mostly on reservation at the side of Avenue Orban, almost all the way to the loop of Stockholm. The first portion of that thoroughfare is very steep, but I don't know the grade. A close up view on the hill. Route 39 was extended from Stockholm to Van Eyck in 1988. In order to serve that portion of the line on the day of the festival, the STIB operated special route 160. Instead of running to Montgomery, however, it ran to Vogt, where the steam train was being displayed and operated. Here is C3000 low floor car 3075 operating on Avenue or Ban among the historic units. Historic but modern looking articulated PCC 7500 at the same location. Brussels first articulated PCC was built as a prototype by Le Bourgeois in 1962. Number 7501 at the time, it was, its performance was disappointing, particularly its acceleration on the hills of the city. The builder continues to develop the concept using the same body design and improve the performance by powering the center trucks to complement the ones in the front and rear. This worked and the STIB ordered 98 in 1972 while renumbering the prototype to 7,500. <coughs> in 1975, this unit was retrofitted to match the other 7,500 cars. As mentioned earlier, in the 1980s, the 7500s were converted into double-ended and renumbered in the 7700 series, but number 7500 remained a single ender. This is the pre-1988 loop of Route 31 in the center of Stockholm with PCC 7500 laying over. Now to the museum itself, where there were some static exhibits. Especially attractive is Omnibus 2 from 1891. The motive power though appeared rather languid. Another tram displayed inside is work car 272 from 1927. Note that the wall, the wall is decorated with Brussels traditional <clears throat> metallic plate root number signs. Jack, Andy Sisk asks if all the cars on the historic fleet are equipped with air brakes or is it a mix. I have no idea. Okay, thank you. We'll finish up the festival with a few views around the museum in the late afternoon. 
the residents of Brussels must be late riders, risers, as the later the hour, the larger the crowds were. Here's a view of outbound number 984 marked for Route 40 being passed by modern T3 unit 3097 on the 8th at Musée du Tram stop. The classic 984 was built in 1906, but retained its green color only until 1914, when yellow became the TB's official livery. It is pulling trailer 301 from 1901. Here is another view of number 984, this time being passed by a train with trailer 244 at its rear at the same location. As mentioned earlier, the 244 was built in 1897. Here's another meet at the Tran Museum stop. Dwell, time, dwell times were quite long because of the large number of visitors arriving while others were either departing or just going out for a ride. Same location with number 346, which we first saw near our hotel in the morning, being passed by an unmodified 56016. Here is four wheeler car from 830 from 1901 racing a bicyclist. Apparently cars of this series were originally used on the Traveran line. Some were modified extensively in the 1930s and those continued to carry passengers as late as 1957. And number 1750 restored to its World War I appearance. Finally, we finished the day's festivities with two original style 5000 series cars passing on Avenue de Tervuren, west of the museum. Except for the panographs on the 5008, this series could have been seen, the scene could have been seen frequently in the days before Brussels entered the PCC era. In fact, on my first visit in 1960, Trevoren was served by the same two routes running directly to and from the, from the center of Brussels, all on surface trackers, as it was before the pre-metro was built. The 45 ran past Gare de Midi, the main railway station just south of the city center, and Route 40 operated past Gare du Nord. Time to change again to the last reel. And another drink. On the previous day, <clears throat> we traveled to Antwerp from Brussels to look at the latest developments in this extensive network of streetcar lines, as well as taking advantage of the Saturday opening of its tram museum. While the skies were cloudy with occasional rain, they cleared up for a short period and we took advantage of that. This is Central Station, a landmark building in the city of about a half million, the largest in the Flemish section of the country and only a 40 minute train ride from Brussels on half hourly express trains. The facade represents the completion of its construction in 1905. 15 years ago, it was converted from a stub end terminal to a through running station for intercity tra trains. My first visit to Antwerp was in 1960, when almost the entire fleet of the local tram system, the MIVA, was made up of ancient four wheelers. And its meter gauge tracks were shared in places with cars of the interurban SNCV, or in Flemish, the NMVB, whose fleets consisted mainly of double truck cars, which were much more modern. But that changed later that year when the company received its first PCC car from Le Bourgeois, number 2000. The order was for 39 multiple unit equipped cars, but the company did not stop there. All in all, 166 single-ended streamliners were built with the last coming in 1975. 
With a large, well-maintained fleet, it is not so surprising that at least 70 of these iconic trams are still carrying passengers almost a half century later. <laughs> Here is an MU train on Route 4 with number 7126 in the lead. In 1991, with the transfer of the company to Flemish area base to Lyon, the cars got a new livery and were renumbered by simply adding 5,000 to the original numbers in the 2000 series. It wasn't until 1999 that the, the line received more cars for its Antwerp system. At that time, the organization chose to order 31 MGT6 low floor articulators from a Siemens Bombardier consortium based on a design for Dresden. They have five sections and the order was repeated, which led to a total of 73 such single-ended cars, the last manufactured in 2012. Number 7327 is shown en route to Hoboken. And here is Hoboken. No, it will not connect there with NJ Transit's Hudson Bergen light rail system. Kinky Sharu 5003 is shown at America's Hoboken Terminal. <laughs> the new low floor units are called Hermaliners. And this one is shown at National Bank, a major junction of four lines. Hermel translates to ermine. Why they're named after a weasel is beyond my understanding. Although I've also heard that these cars are called salamanders. A train of PCCs on Route 7 at Harmony, also a major junction of four lines. And back at National Bank with the back, bank building in the background. It dates from 1879 and is now occupied by offices. Antwerp's oldest operating PCC, number 2001, now 7001, has been restored to its 1960 appearance. It is usually found running on the 11, a lightly used route, which doesn't need MU trains. Berkham Station is nearby, which before the conversion of Central Station for through running was the only stop in Antwerp for trains from Paris and Brussels to Amsterdam. Its turning loop is beyond the station, only a few feet from the Flemish Transport Museum, which is open only on weekend afternoons. So we timed our visits for a 1 p.m. arrival. And I soon found out the 7001 is owned by the museum and only operates on dates the museum is open. As it turned out, the museum was busy as there were quite a few visitors, mostly rail fans who had also traveled to Belgium for the Brussels Festival. In fact, many spoke English and quite a number were from Britain, like my tra traveling companion, Andrew. While the descriptions accompanying all the displayed cars were entirely in Flemish or Dutch, the museum volunteers were all fluent in our language and easily answered our questions. The museum occupies the tramways systems formerly Hoonenbuk Hotel. Oh, I said hotel, I meant car house. Well, it could be a hotel. I've tried to organize these slides in the sequence of, their construction, of the construction date of their subject, which is not necessarily in order of their numbers. So we'll start with 200. This charming four-wheeler was built in 1901. The museum was beautifully lit even, and I used ASA 100 film to capture this shot and the following ones, and yet it was indoors. Number 305 was built in 1903 and operated in revenue service until 1947. The 601 shown alongside is a trailer built in 1922. Single trucker number 181 was built in 1911. Note the front windshield. 
Number 484 was built in 1913, while the 550 came in 1929. The latter was one of 30 trams constructed to provide additional capacity for visit, visitors to Antwerp's 1930 World's Fair. In 1956, the 550 and its brethren were modernized with lengthened platforms and rather trendy sloping wooden screens. There are some Ghent cars in the museum's collection as well. Open bench car 216, which certainly is fast, fancy looking, was built in 1908 as part of an order of 19 units. Considering the weather in Flanders, some think it odd that open cars ever operated in Ghent. In the early 1920s, the car was enclosed and later in that decade, it was lengthened and placed on three axle Bissell trucks, becoming car 312. Then in 1937, it was converted to a work car, which probably explains its retention after the rest of the series was scrapped in the late 1960s. In 1974, it was restored to its original condition. It was sent to the Brussels Museum in 1982 and eventually found its way back to Antwerp. Jack, are these all static or do some of them operate or is there a mix? Yes. A question. I believe um, there's a track connection to the uh, system from the museum. And I believe some of them can be operated. Okay, thank you. Dent car 328 was also built as a four wheeler number 112 in 1905. Like the 216, its body was extended and placed on three axle Bissell trucks. And in 1929, it became Smiling Car 328. It remained in service until the 1970s. It too ended up preserved in Brussels before it came to Antwerp. As mentioned earlier, Antwerp number 305 at the right was built in 1903. There are also Vicinal cars in the museum's collection as the SNCV had quite a large meter gauge network in the Antwerp area. Number 9994, an example of the standardized Vicinal cars built when the network was undergoing a great spurt of electrification during the depression was built as a trailer in 1930. But the wooden car was converted to a motor soon afterwards. A total of 152 wooden standards were built, followed by 248 ones of steel between 1934 and 1948. Andrew Beach commented, this no cars ran on some dodgy track and their springing could also be uneven due to deferred maintenance. This meant that they could sometimes be seen leaning at an appreciable angle. This photo shows number 9994 doing just that. Some of the SNCV's class S motors were built using the bodies of these standards starting in the 1950s. And here is one of them, the S class motor 9785, shown wearing its wreath as the last visible tram to operate in the Antwerp area. It was built from a wooden standard similar to 90. 994 in 1959 and closed the SNCV era in Antwerp in May 1968. Before being obtained by the museum, it was transferred to Brussels. And when that system closed in 1978, it worked the coastal tramway for a few more years. It was preserved in 1984. You may know that some of the S-Class cars finished their lives in the Gijón Aviles area of Spain, and others were modernized for Valencia. MIVA 7386 is shown on the left, sitting next to the Vicinal car. There were not many four axle cars on Antwerp's local tramway, and number 7386 was actually built for a subsidiary of a predecessor company that held the franchise were operating the Vicinal system north of the city, which consisted of former steam and electric lines that were built to Cape Gauge, that is three foot six inches. 
the unit from 1908 was part of a group of 20 built for Vicino Andersois, a subsidiary that threw in the towel in 1921. Nine of the 20 cars were transferred to the meter gauge local system where they were regaged. They survived until the 1970s when enough PCCs had become available to hold down service. Of course, the over 65 year old cars had been improved and rebuilt several times by then. The remaining 11 of these trams were transferred to the SNCV in 1921 and regaged as well, and they lasted until 1959. ART-40 was a fossil fuel car used on non-electrified vicinal rural lines. Originally classed as AR, autorail, when the passenger service on these lines were replaced by buses, some of these units were rebuilt to supplant steam tram locomotives in freight duty. These became ARTs with the T standing for tracteur. Number 40 was built in 1934. Its odd buffers and coupling came about from having been equipped to operate on a vicinal mixed gauge line, hauling and shunting SNCB, Belgian National Railways freight cars. It has a GMC diesel motor. I was able to ride in one of these over former SNCB tracks at the Thuan Museum near Shalawa. And now the first PCC to have been built for the MIVA, number 2000 in 1960. It is shown in my favorite color scheme, which received in 1984. The handsome red and white livery began to be replaced by the current one in 1981 when DeLine took over the operation of the local tramway. Its destination sign reads Hoonanhook, the location of the museum and the loop of the number 11 line. After visiting the museum, we were very fortunate to catch the 7001 on the 11 line again. And then the sun made a reappearance. Here is a Hermaliner leaving the eastern portal of one of Antwerp's pre-metro tunnels. Antwerp inaugurated the first portion of its now extensive tram subway in 1975. The system opened piecemeal with a major extension on the Schelder River to its left bank, Linke Uber, coming to fruition in 1990. Further extensions have come since and others continue to be constructed. This slide was taken at the Halle Vineland stop where the ramp from Frederick von Aden station brings four routes to the surface. And here's the river. As you can see on the map, eight of the city's 14 tram lines use the pre-metro. Its length is just over eight miles compared to a total of about 50 miles for the entire tramway network. One of the short albatross trams approaches the regatta stop. Originally called Linka Uver, meaning left bank, it still contains a terminal loop now used only by Route 15. A large parking garage and an additional loop were recently added to the new Linka Uver park and ride station, one stop to the west where routes five and nine terminate. The three continues further over a 2002 extension to Zweindrecht. This is the first time I've mentioned the name Albatross. This is a nickname given to 62 new Bombardier Flexity II trams that began to be delivered in 2016. There are 38 of the five section types shown with the remaining 24 being seven section cars like these, also shown on the Linka Uber side of the Skelder River. Now DeLine has ordered even newer trams from CAF for both the Coastal Tramway and Antwerp. The delivery of the Urbos 100s, which I believe has already begun, will mean that whatever remaining PCCs remain on the roster will be relegated to rush hours only. 
This is a photo of a car from the first part of the order, which has begun operating on the line's coastal tramway. That completes the Antwerp portion. On Monday, May 23rd, we took an EMU to Ghent, some 35 miles west of Brussels. Its population is about 240,000, which makes it only half the size of Antwerp and thus it has a much smaller tramway, consisting of only three lines and 20 miles of route. It took us about 35 minutes to get there, and our first view is at the railway station, St. Peter's. The station is shown on the left and is accessible from two tram stops. This is the easternmost, serving routes two and four. Just like Antwerp and the coastal tramway, Ghent's streetcar system is operated is meter gauge and operated by the line. Behind the LRV is a traffic and streetcar circle, which brings in line one as well. The rolling stock situation in Ghent is similar to Antwerp's, but without the PCCs and with double-ended rather than single-ended low floor cars. Unfortunately, the PCC streamliners are now out of service although two of the double-ended units have been retained as work cars. Gent's roster consists of 41 five-section Hermaliners and 25 seven-section Albatross Flexities twos. A building covers the other stop for the railway station, served by Route 1. A passageway connects the two forms of electric traction. This is a Hermaliner. It was dark and gloomy for most of our visit, and so when the sun came, suddenly came out, we hopped off our Route 4 car at the next stop and got this photo. The location is Rabat, where Line 1 and Route 4 briefly run on the same track. We continued on the 1 toward the city center and got off at Ravenstein in order to photograph trams passing the castle of the same name. This imposing medieval structure dates from the year 1180. By then we lost the sun and the skies got worse and worse, culminating in heavy rain. A Flexity 2 LRV is making the turn from the city center toward the northern end of Route 1. Right behind the castle on Kleiner Fismarkt, which translates to small fish market, uh, which is the name of the street, an inbound Route 1 albatross passes two beautiful traditional Flemish houses. They were built in 1581 and house a few stores below the apartments. The bridge crosses the Lys or Lea River, a tributary of the Skelda. The center of Kent is beautiful with many streets closed to motor traffic. I've been here on several occasions and had good weather only in the days when the Karen Mark was clogged with motor traffic. But now automobiles have been banned. Unfortunately, there were too many pedestrians in front of my camera for decent photos on this visit. However, I found this photo on the internet taken by Christian Wenger, one of the 50 of one of the 54 double-ended PCCs that Le Bourgeois delivered to Ghent from 1971 to 1974, predating the current low floor articulated units. They were painted in this beautiful shade of blue until the municipally operated MIVG was turned over to the line in 1991. Now back to the dismal weather with another view on the center's periphery, showing a Route 4 Hermaliner and the medieval Belfry Tower. Much of the building was completed in the year 1380, although the spire has undergone a number of changes to accommodate more bells, with the latest version dating from just after World War I. This view is from slightly southeast of the city center the corn mart. What was just a drizzle began turning to heavy rain, and so we rode more of the network from line end to line end. 
This photo of a Hermaliner was taken at the Melodieu terminal of Route 2. Now to the other end of the two. This is the Zweinada Bibliothek terminal, showing two Hermaliners with their destination signs already changed. The extension of the network to this point is the system's most recent in 2016. Lastly, a view in pouring rain for the Everham Brielkin, Brielkin, not Brooklyn, terminal of Route 1, featuring an albatross. This is the northernmost point of the system. And instead of having a scissors crossover, over, it has a double slip switch to control movements. This photo con concludes the program. And I will, I hope that you have enjoyed it. I'm going to stop sharing and return everything back. I can find the stop share button and it's right up here. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Hi, Jack, it's Andrew. A terrific presentation tonight. I have a quick question. In Antwerp, where there's an overlap with the metro now, the uh, the pre-metro and the, the trams on the street, on the same ones, um, what are they doing? Are they gonna shut the street running down altogether? Do you know? No, the metro is at this point, it is probably full of trams. So uh, they would have to build another metro line really to take the uh, remaining trams in the center of the uh, city and take them underground. Because the eight, I see the eight goes through the metro and this is the east-west metro, not the north-south one, right? There's, a, there's an east-west one now. Yeah, yes, I showed the map uh, yeah. a few slides ago. Right, right. So, but it runs right under a street where they still have street running, which is kind of unusual. Right. And we actually rode uh, and photographed the street running, running portion, but I didn't want to make the uh, show even longer. <laughs> and uh, as it happened during that time period, it was really dark outside. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Really Jack, great. it was an outstanding program, and thanks for the plug for the 2024 um, International Convention. But these were outstanding the photos. Portland Convention. Yeah. And yes, I no, appreciate that. Go ahead, folks. And you yeah, can a great show, Jack. Go on. You all the summer. The summer that. in 2022 was very warm, especially in Paris. Did you have any problem with the heat over there, or uh, when no. you were traveling? Oh yeah, so not at all. We were very lucky to be between heat waves, but it was warm, but uh, no, not much warmer than it is in late May and early June. We were just lucky. France During has rain in uh, Belgium. It was quite cold, and I was very happy. I had a jacket along, which I wore every day. Yeah, the number of light rail systems in France has to be one of the largest in the world now, uh, com right. comparable to Germany or? Uh... Well, I haven't counted Germany, but there's uh, about, I think, 28 uh, light rail systems in France, of which three are upgraded uh, legacy systems, and the other 25 are all new. Wow. And so France has done a magnificent job in taking what was almost nothing and bringing up it up to a very modern urban transit country. And we're still looking for our first light rail line in uh, New York City, not even close. Maybe we'll be lucky with the- uh, The Brooklyn, Brooklyn Queens Express. Brooklyn Queens Express. Uh, um, you know, based on the history, here in the New York area, where light rail seems to be a very bad word, I'm, I'll just uh, go along and hope for the best. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Jack, uh, a two-part question. One, the cars that are being retired in Paris, do you know if there's any plan to preserve them or, or any of them? And secondly, what happened with the uh, uh, rubber tire uh, cars from uh, uh, Cayenne? 
Good question. I don't know if any of those are preserved. I think I could look it up and get back to you, Rich. And my bet is that the TFS two cars will be preserved, at least a few of them. You also have to realize that TFS two cars are still operating in Grenoble. Mm -hmm. And the TFS two cars that were built for Rouen are now operating in Gaziantep in Turkey. Wow. Yeah, I was wow. just going to ask if the ones in Grenoble are still running. You, they are. Those are the very first ones, right? Grenoble was the first one. I don't know the exact order. They all came within a short time of each other. Uh, I need to correct you. There's no longer a country named Turkey. <laughs> That's true. Uh, uh, this, I, just read to, I just read today that, that to call Turkey is to insult the country, and the State Department has respelt and repronounced the way we pronounce Turkey. So just be careful. I don't want you to get in trouble. Yeah, it's I hope they haven't changed the pronunciation of cranberry sauce. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, Jack, there was a question here on the screen from John Williams. Ask, uh, what is the reason that you shoot on film instead of digital? There were a couple questions. Purely inertia. <laughs> I have no, I don't know why I didn't change over. That was a great show, but I think we should it, all remember. Very, very expensive to shoot film compared to digital. Yeah, I think we should all remember Jack showing more pictures of the tramways into Ukraine than I think anybody, and we all appreciate that. That's right. Well, there's going to be more and next. I'm very month. saddened about what's happening there. Yes. Yeah, Jack, uh, this is Carl. Did you notice a significant amount of difference in the ride quality of the uh, tram units, especially in France, that were operating at higher speeds? I mean, uh, there were. I noticed that there were track alignments that were ballasted. And uh, certainly uh, the ones that uh, had grass in the middle, but for the most part, the ones where the units were operating at a much higher speed, uh, what was the ride quality like? Good point. Um, I really didn't notice a difference. Um, the uh, trams reached some high speeds in many different places, but high speeds are generally not the rule in France. I mean, they go fast. Uh, in the few trolley subways or tram subways. And uh, in Lyon, there are a number of places where the is a large distance between stops and they really step on it uh, between those points. Okay. But That's otherwise, it, it's somewhat lackadaisical. Right. As far as film goes, <laughs> Jack's slides will last a lot longer than your digital scans. Uh, can you imagine if you were taking digital pictures in 1960, you'd have nothing left today. But you and I, Richard, we, yeah. we traveled to Europe for the first time in 1960, and we have all of our slides. Now, all my code I've from. never digitized the ones from that year. I'm and slowly, I'm slowly, digi yeah, Brian, Brian is slowly digitizing. Brian slowly digitizing yours. Yeah, no, Brian is digitizing mine. The colors are perfect. There's been no fade in 60 years. I, I, there's a way of testing that. And uh, the scans are very good too. But the slides are less. Also, your pictures, the colors are better on, on, on your slides. Oh, guaranteed. Yeah. Yeah, well, you know, film is actually making a, a comeback. I saw something on PBS uh, the other day and uh, for example, uh, Nikon's that were a hundred hundred and fifty dollars here uh, a year ago are yeah. now two hundred dollars. So yeah. it's pretty much going the same way as uh, vinyl, vinyl for records, uh, yeah. records and uh, in fact, Hollywood is now rewriting all their digital movies onto three uh, three color separation, the old Technicolor process film, uh, and they're spending over a billion dollars a year on Kodak black and white film because that's what lasts. Yep, that's what lasts. Also takes up less space. <laughs> well, Jack, I have to go, but uh, outstanding. I, 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 there's no Thanks, other Carl. words that I can use. Really uh, uh, great detail. And uh, certainly, I, I don't know how you keep all that, uh, uh, all the uh, roster information uh, uh, separate and, uh, and uh, concise. So uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for the compliment.
It was I also say program. the same. Very well organized, excellent uh, uh, photographs, and very well presented. You had very good turnout. I think your high turnout was 139. So that's one of our oh. highest turnouts. So. Oh, no. <laughs> and you had 130 for most of it. So very, uh -huh. very well deserved. Good to hear. <laughs> And Jack, uh, here's a greeting from Germany, Karl Heinz. I say thank you for the remembering of our great tours in this year. It was fantastic and was really good. But uh, as one thing for digitalizing, it's good to have a digitalized photos because they are always the point where I took the photo. I don't have notice, don't, don't write notices where we are. I can make a picture of it. And remember where we are. You have a lot of things to write where, to know where we uh, what was. Thank you very much. I have to go to bed now. It's now well, 14. Well, in well, well, Heinz, you were standing next to me in both Brussels and Paris. So you have real digital uh, slides of the exact same scenes. But you have, uh, I think also you have a better quality of the picture because it's. Uh, the the uh, analog version, the uh, the colors are brilliant, more brilliant than the dig digital yeah. ones. Um, Jack, this is Mike Flick, and uh, besides the subject matter, which is unbelievably good, the photography is just amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Jack, company... do you have any upcoming trips planned? <laughs> well, in a little over a week, to be exact, in eleven days. Claire and I are leaving for the Middle East. Where? We're going to Doha in Qatar and Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Mm. Uh, this trip uh, is not going to be like the previous ones, which we're getting up there. And it's basically an escorted tour. But in the schedule, it appears that there's going to be enough free time for me to photograph the metro and tramways in both of those cities. So we have something to look forward to. Right. <laughs> That's wonderful. Okay. Okay. Good night from Germany. Good night. Uh, good good night. 15. You stayed up to four fifteen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. I have to stay. Uh, for, I have to fly up to start the, the day. morning in in Germany. It's okay. Bye. <laughs> Say hello to Monica. <laughs> yeah, thanks. A lot of greetings to Claire. Oh, my God. Uh, are there any other comments or questions on Jack's outstanding presentation? And it will be posted within about a week. It may be a little less. It'll be on ERA TV. And just a reminder, the next program is February 17th. And Eric Zostowitz will be presenting on Ukraine. So... Any other comments or questions uh, uh, going once, going twice? I want to once again. Where is, excuse me, where is the ERA TV? Is it on YouTube? It is. You go to erausa.org and it's one of the click selections. Okay, great. Thank you. Sure. Yep. This is a real treasure. And thanks for letting us post that, Jack. So one more time, any My other pleasure. comments or questions? Jack, thank you very much. It was an outstanding program. You covered a lot of ground and a lot of new ground. So, all right, going once, going twice. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. See you February 17th. Good night. Good night, all.